So this workshop is Home Energy Efficiency and Home so Solar. And in this workshop, we will hear from three speakers about important ways that you can improve your home energy efficiency or add home solar power. We're going to hear from Claire Chang um, <coughs> from Greenfield Solar about solar programs and incentives for homeowners. We'll hear from Mark Tajima about home energy efficiency and Ashley Musprat um, about mini splits and heat pumps. So I'm going to um, start by introducing um, Claire Chang. She is um, the co-owner of Greenfield Solar from 2009 to the present. Um, they do designing and installing of residential and small commercial solar PV systems for Western Mass. She's also affiliated with Mass Solar, where she's vice president since 2014. Um, they do advocacy on the Mass uh, State Renewable Energy and Solar Policy. Um, to incentivize and increase residential solar installations to meet 2050 climate and GHG emission goals. She's also on the Town of Gill Finance Committee and Energy Commission. So, Claire. Do you want to hold that? Right there? Yeah. Hi there. Thank you for the great intro. And I'm so sorry it's really bright and sunny and wonderful outside, and we have to be inside. It always seems to be a conundrum there like that. So um, I was tasked with providing um, you all with um, some information about solar programs and incentives, how to choose a solar company or buy power from a renewable-based supplier. I have a handout, so if anyone is missing one, there are some up here on the stage. Um, and there's also more materials as well. Um, so I wanted to start with some of the possibilities for solar, what um, is available out there, what is commonly um, installed in our area. So a dual access all earth renewable tracker, these are made and designed in Vermont. They're absolutely wonderful. They face the sun all day long and will generate about 40% more than just a fixed mounted array. And as you can see in this picture, they have a snow mode where they will actually anticipate that it's going to snow, move the tracker to north, and dump the snow so that it doesn't block in front. Um, these are really wonderful uh, devices. Then this is a commercial roof mounted. It's actually Dean's Beans and Orange Mass. Um, residential, I think everybody has seen um, plenty around town. This is a ground mounted, so several poles in the ground. And these can have, come in all different shapes and configurations and sizes. Um, this is a carport. Um, we have a local builder who's been building the wooden structures for our customers. And then we put the solar panels on. Um, this provides both shade and um, comfort for the um, vehicles and um, generates electricity. And we can also put an EV charger in there, too, as well. So federal incentives. Um, these are federal tax credits. They're 20% this year. And as you can sell with the, see with the schedule, they go down for each succeeding year. Uh, they do apply against tax liability. But if you can't use them in any one particular year, they'll roll over. Commercial systems are also eligible for the MACRS, which is a five-year depreciation schedule, which you really need to talk to your tax accountant to, to understand the managed the mechanics of all of that. Um, the state incentives, same thing. There's a tax credit, which is 15%, but capped at $1,000. And there's also net metering credits. So this was something that Joe uh, Comerford brought up very briefly. We do enjoy here in the state of Massachusetts full retail net metering credits, minus a few little mills, um, on excess generation from your PV system each month. And they will accrue indefinitely. The utility cannot take them away. They also, though, will not cash them out. So if you have a credit on your electric bill, typically what people do is generate more in the summer and then use it up in the wintertime because everybody's moving to heat pumps and using electricity to heat their houses. If you don't use that credit up, though, you can allocate through a Schedule Z to other accounts, electricity accounts, in your same utility territory. However, that climate bill, the, um, the one that passed in March of 21, 
actually has a provision in it where we can allocate to other utilities. So if you live like here in Eversource and you want to allocate to someone in National Grid, that will be possible. However, the DPU, the Department of Public Utilities, has been very underlined, bold, italicized, slow at enacting this legislation. It's been a year, and we have not seen it move through any docket or process allowing stakeholder information or hearings, nothing. So um, we need to get Joe to move this process forward. Um, but the utilities don't want it, so. Uh, let me see here. Uh, so net metering, currently we're limited for this, to enjoy this full retail net metering to under 10 kilowatts and under on single phase and 25 kilowatts and under on three phase. That's, those are maybe too much information, but your uh, company, who might be us, could um, give you all that information. And then if you install larger than that, you get market rate. Now you think market rate, well that should be better. No, that's what the utilities give you with a 40% reduction in the value of your credits. Does that make? <laughs> so you don't want market rate. All right, class one RECs. So RECs are renewable energy credits. These are part of the renewable portfolio standard that Joe mentioned that increases by 3% every year after 2025. Um, they're currently, I think, only increasing by 2%. So every little percentage, these are very small numbers, will get us towards 100, but it's very incremental. And as the gentleman um, in our keynotes mentioned, we're not moving fast enough, and particularly here in Massachusetts, we're not definitely not moving fast enough. <laughs> I'm not as familiar with a lot of other states. Uh, California is doing a great job, and Hawaii is also, but Massachusetts. So class one RECs currently sell at about two and a half to four cents per kilowatt hour, and that's for the life of the system. So it's another incentive you get from the state. The mass uh, smart incentive you probably have heard about. It's a declining block. It started in 2019. At this point, it's negative, which does not benefit you. So we are not signing up any residential systems for class one, I mean, uh, smart incentive. Now, this is the hopeful part. Future incentives. The feds need to pass, and this is Congress, the Build Back Better bill. It actually has a 30% tax credit for solar and an extension for 10 years. That gives us a good ramp up period and some stability and an ability to actually grow the industry enough and to allow everyone um, to put solar on their houses and reap the benefits by um, risking their own capital. There's also a refundability portion. This is for low and moderate income folks who don't have the tax liability or nonprofits to be able to enjoy that same tax credit. So they'll need to file a tax return, but they'll get a refund of whatever that 30% tax credit is in a check. So no, this is particularly useful for nonprofits who have no ability right now to take advantage of the federal tax credit. They have to leave that on the table or they have to go through a third party supplier and that one, increases the cost, two, locks them in for a 20 year contract, three, gets all the big investors, tax equity partners involved, which is great. We want big money to be involved, but we, the little people, also want to participate and own what we can. So you need to call Warren and Markey. Tell all your friends who live in other states, even Republican states, to put the pressure on to get Build Back Better to move. In the State House, Joe and Natalie mentioned a few bills that are moving their way through. The legislative session ends July 31st. Unfortunately, we find a lot of this stuff happens on the very last day at the very last hour, but um, we need to still uh, persevere. So Bill H3344 reduces, eliminates the $1,000 cap on the state residential tax credit for solar. 
and so to allow for the full 15%. This was originally uh, enacted in like 20, no, 1970s when solar hot water was the big technology that everybody was trying to push. So costs for solar hot water were much lower than they are for PV. So they thought, well, 15% is enough and $1,000 is enough. But in 1970 dollars, that's a lot more now in 2020 dollars. So we need to update this legislation and make it more valuable and also add a refundability amendment so that low and moderate income homeowners can also benefit. The Senate is also working on an energy bill that Joe mentioned, and we need in there also is to lift that net metering cap. Instead of restricting it to 10 kilowatts and under, we need to expand it to cover the whole entire class one, which is one to 60 kilowatts. And that way, everybody will benefit from full net metering credits. I forgot to mention, so in that climate bill that we passed in March of 21, class two and class three, so that's above 60 kilowatts and above one megawatts, they now get full retail net metering. Is that fair? Something's wrong here. So we're trying to correct that error with this um, little piece. So write your senators and representatives. So the next part is how to choose a solar company. And you can read the stuff here. Basically, you should choose us. <laughs> um, so there are certainly advantages to all of the different companies. And I would certainly choose someone local. I would not choose someone national because we've seen like real good solar, direct energy solar. Um, there are a few others that have completely drop the ball on all their local, on all their, our local customers. They've left the residential marketplace, they've moved on to other states, they've uh, been really egregious in their um, follow through and warranty um, claims. So a local company, we're right on Main Street in Greenfield, you can come and find us and open the door and say, I need to talk to you. And we'll answer the phones. It's a real person. It's not a robo. So there's uh, extreme benefits to a, a local company. The other thing we hear a lot is, well, you're not a cooperative. That's true. We're not a cooperative. But we're family owned. And we're local. And we actually answer the phone after 5 o'clock and before 8. And we answer our emails. And we're in the community constantly every day because we live here and this is who we want to share the wealth with um, let me see here ah the other piece was community uh, if you can't put solar on your own house for a number of reasons in fact 75 percent of the population can't then what are your options a true community shared solar farm would be the best option. You would own a little piece of it and the electricity would come, or the net metering credits would come to you. Electricity still goes out onto the grid and is distributed wherever nearby on the distribution system. But the financial and legal structures for community shared solar farms out here has been very constrained by the utilities with their interconnection costs that Joe had mentioned and also there are a number of other esoteric reasons. So unfortunately for most people you have to join a national group. There are a few local, uh, not local, Massachusetts wide developers who do smaller projects um, but you've got to get in on the ground floor, check what their fees are and the termination schedules. Um, and the last paragraph, this is actually the best thing. For somebody who's got a barn roof that can put a gazillion panels on, but that's way too much electricity for you yourself to use, you can form a small little cooperative yourself, informally or formally, where people help you pay for the system, but they reap the electricity benefits and you allocate those net metering credits to their electricity account. And I think that's where we as small rural communities out here have the benefit of networking 
and providing electricity and the renewable energy for our neighbors through you know, these joint efforts. Um, oh, and this is our contact information. Uh, and are there any questions? I'm wondering if we heard that there's going to be more rain. How is the solar industry thinking about compensating? Some of the rain, so the rain is actually beneficial. It cleans the bird poop and the pollen off. Um, and actually, if it rains instead of snows, that's more generation in the winter time because a snowpack will, depending on the slope, if it's a very shallow array, will lock on and you could lose production for as long as that snowpack is sitting there. So rain is better, quote unquote, um, in the winter time. Um, now, this last July of 21, we had an awful lot of rainy, cloudy days. And yes, that impacted solar generation. So it's, um, it's not a matter of compensating. It's just that your expectations and what we calculate for what you will generate will be decreased slightly. But um, it, it's hard to predict a specific event um, and how it will impact generation um, because there are so many other factors to take into account, including shading, uh, pitch, azimuth, um, and other things. Yes. Can I just add to that? Yes. Um, I have solar. Uh, I'm sure, sure who asked the question. And um, I am running a $500 credit. I've had it for about two years. And I got to figure out how I'm going to use this money up because I can't get it. So even with all the, the weather, um, I still am running a surplus. That really depends. I had a, yeah. I had a solar in my last place. And over the years, the last two years were significantly lower generation than the years before. So there could be other issues, in fact, technical issues, depending on, OK. But I'm just saying there can be an, a number of issues that need to be addressed before we can say specifically that it's weather related. Yes. So are uh, batteries a viable option here to you, like for so to store the energy so you can get off the grid? So I don't, we don't encourage people to go off grid because that takes you out of the community. The community is grid tied and by you generating extra electricity at noon, that benefits all your neighbors who can't put solar on their houses or can't generate electricity. So, but batteries, oh yes. Um, so time of use rates would help alleviate their extreme benefit of you generating your alone electricity at the highest peak cost time frames. Unfortunately, in Massachusetts, we don't have time of use rates. Now, they're actually part of the grid mod bill, so hopefully that will be enacted. But as you noted, that bill was, uh, or the docket for grid mod was opened in 2014. Nothing. Literally nothing has happened on that grid bod bill before the DPU. Now, most of that blame I can put on Governor Baker and his appointees for commissioner. So hopefully if we get a Democratic governor pitch for Mora or somebody who's Democratic, then we'll get a better DPU and we'll be able to start moving some of this stuff through. However, the DPU is just like any other legislative judicial operation agency, it, they're going to take their time. But at least we'll have a chance. Now to address your question about batteries, certainly batteries are real now. You can, we can certainly retrofit any existing PV system to add batteries or design a new system to have batteries included as part of it. You need to be aware though that fire codes are in flux. And so there may be a need for wherever those batteries are located to be um, reinforced with fire code drywall and blah, blah, blah. The, um, there is an increased cost for batteries, which can throw it out of the equation. Um, I'm not sure what the lending opportunities are uh, for battery storage. Um, we haven't had to 
deal with that yet, but um, it, it's a complicated um, scenario. And I think I, my time's up. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so next we're going to hear from Mark Tajima um, from uh, Energy LLC in Holyoke about home energy efficiency. And Mark is uh, one of the founding worker owners of Energy LLC since 2009. Energy is one of only is one of the only 100% worker-owned energy services co-ops in the United States. Prior to working at Energia, Mark worked in the emerging market development at several financial service banks for 20 plus years, as well as 10 years teaching in Cambridge and Amherst, Massachusetts. Energia is a building performance insulation company working in all market sectors from residential to multifamily, commercial, municipal, industrial education, and nonprofit sectors. So, Mark. You said it all. I don't need to say anything more. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, a little mea culpa before we get started. Uh, I didn't read the fine print about this, so I prepared a 60-minute presentation. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip through my, my uh, slides pretty quickly. Thank you very much. Um, and um, all of the photos are, are of uh, projects that, uh, that Energy has worked on uh, in, in Western Massachusetts. Um, uh, as, uh, as Christopher said, we are a, a worker-owned co-op. Um, and um, we, we started out about 13 years ago. And um, we, had, uh, we were started by a, a, another co-op in our area, Co-op Power. Uh, and I believe someone from Co-op Power is going to be speaking here later this afternoon also. Um, we're, a, a, as it says, a socially and environmentally responsible company. We try to, um, we try to work with like-minded organizations and partners, and uh, you'll see that as we talk about some of the projects that we've worked on. Um, we have uh, 28 people now, actually, uh, five cellulose insulation trucks and two spray foam trucks, and um, we go out uh, every day sort of working on, on projects uh, across, across the western end of the state. Um, we do uh, energy assessments, um, and ultimately, uh, it, hopefully, it leads to a project that is uh, air sealing, uh, weatherization, and insulation related. Um, we do not do HVAC uh, at present, um, although I was talking with Ashley before the, uh, the session and um, uh, talking about some, some money that might be coming down the pike to help companies uh, convert uh, from being insulation only to also doing HVAC. Um, the state and, and uh, the country has some very ambitious electrification goals, and uh, the only way we get there is, uh, is to you know, have more companies that are doing these installs. They have some great incentives for mini splits, and, and I think that's the subject of what Ashley's going to be, be talking about. Um, I have a whole thing here on the mass safe structure of the programs, and uh, I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with it, so I won't totally go into that. Um, but um, from, from our side, we, we are uh, the one in the bottom right corner. We're an independent installation contractor, and uh, that means that we work with our, our partner uh, lead vendors, uh, and that would be uh, organizations like CET, the Center for Ecotechnology, uh, Clear Results, Rise Engineering, and Abode, um, and they help, um, uh, they help find projects. They also do audits, and they send a certain amount of work to us. Uh, we also generate our own work, but having these great partnerships is, is just so important. Um, we work on you know, single-family homes, of course. Um, we are, I think we, we, we just hit the 6,500 project marker uh, over 13 years. And you know, that's residential projects, small single-family homes, or you know, large commercial projects. Um, and you know, 6,500, that's, uh, that's almost a small town, you know, a small city. So you know, we, we, thank you, thank you. We, we like to sort of think about the, you know, the bigger impact that we're having on our community. This is a house in Holyoke that was actually the second house that we insulated, and it was for one of our board members uh, who, who lived there. And uh, boy, we, we insulated the, the walls dent with dense pack cellulose, um, and we did uh, a net and blow dense pack cellulose with rigid board up in the attic space, and then uh, spray foamed the entire rubble basement. Um, 
And uh, even though this house was really quite old and, and just so loose that you could hear the wind roaring around it before we started, um, one of the comments afterwards was that um, this, this, they couldn't hear the traffic on the street anymore. So that's one of these sort of secondary benefits that you see from insulation that, that nobody really talks about. Um, we also always think about energy efficiency and energy savings in the wintertime. Uh, and of course, that's you know the meat and potatoes, I guess, of a lot of what we do. But there's a commensurate amount of savings and, and comfort that comes in the summertime as well. Um, it, it tends to be electrical savings in the summertime, um, and you know, oil, gas, propane, or whatever in the wintertime. Uh, here's just another project that we did um, at State Street Fruit Store in Northampton. Some of you probably know this. Uh, this store is open seven days a week, and. Um, we did this project, we st and they always stay open until like 10 p.m. almost every night. So we started at 10.30 p.m. and stopped at 5 a.m., uh, did this project for four days with three crews there. Um, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, we, we work on large commercial buildings, even like this. This is um, a commercial building in Holyoke where we did a spray foam project on the entire upper envelope of the building. This, um, this is a dorm at uh, Mount Holyoke College. Um, I think we're on our 25th uh, building or dormitory at Mount Holyoke. Um, we, I think uh, we're probably over 250 projects on campuses uh, around our area. Um, a lot uh, with Williams College, uh, Smith College, Mount Holyoke, and, and even one or two with UMass. Uh, oh, their, their building stock tends to be a little bit newer than ours. Um, these are some of the tools. I, I think most of you probably have seen these before, but this is a blower door, uh, where, how, which we use to measure a whole house air leakage in buildings, and that gives us a sense of how tight buildings are. We do this test before we start our project, and then we do it again at the end of our project, and that tells us um, how successful we were in tightening up the building. Uh, another one of the tools we use pretty regularly is an uh, infrared scan of buildings. Um, and this can really you know, highlight certain areas. Um, uh, you can sort of see from the pictures um, you know, the, the, the heat or the cold, in this case, coming through. And that can guide us and give us um, some ideas, not a, a whole picture, but a partial picture of you know, where we should target uh, our, our, our opportunities and, uh, and the work that we're doing. Um, Air sealing, that's, that's one of the ones that, that is sort of the hidden, um, hidden things that uh, really are the mo one of the most important things that you can do in a building. Almost every building I go into, and I go into four or five a day, um, almost all of them have some insulation. Um, usually it's inadequate, usually it's just two or three inches. Um, they're supposed to be at about 14 to 15 inches of blown insulation to meet current stretch code in, in the state. Um, but I would say that almost none of them have air sealing. And air sealing is, is half the game. Um, you know, air sealing, as you can see, we use these little foam guns and different materials to seal up leaks, chases, bypasses, plumbing, electrical, cable, drop soffits. Every wall that goes up into an attic has a wall top that needs to be sealed. And if you don't seal that and just put insulation on top of it, all you're doing is slowing down the heat loss. You're not really stopping anything. Um, so it's the combination of the air sealing and the insulation that makes for a well-weatherized building. Um, you, you see we do this um, air sealing around different areas. At the one chimney in the picture, that's uh, metal flashing and fire block rated caulking that seals around, uh, around the chimney um, because uh, you have to use slightly different materials on a heated surface. Um, dense pack cellulose, this is uh, also one of the meat and potatoes of what we do. Um, primarily, we do this from the outside. It's where we take off a, a piece of siding, whether it's clapboard, shingle, vinyl, um, uh, take that off, uh, usually underneath one course underneath the window, uh, drill a hole into the sheathing, and then pack cellulose into the cavity. These are some pictures of some projects that we've worked on. Um, when you're doing it from the inside, uh, you can also drill through uh, plaster and lath or drywall, of course. But uh, in the case where you have uh, open framing, uh, meaning the drywall's not up yet, we oftentimes staple this mesh netting between the studs and then dense pack the cellulose into that cavity. Um, that can make for a pretty, uh, pretty robustly insulated building. Um, there's all sorts of challenges and problems, and I won't really get into it, but you know, not all walls are created equal. Let's just say that. Um, 
loose blown cellulose. This is what we do up in attics. Um, you see those little rulers uh, in, the, in the top uh, right side picture? Um, that tells us how deep the insulation is that we're, that we're blowing, and it, it allows the person who's blowing the insulation to sort of see where they're at. You're supposed to have one of these tags you know, within sight at all times. Um, I think one for every 150 square feet. Um, we also build these walkways in the, in the picture on the lower left. That's a, a dormitory, I believe, in Mount Holyoke College. Um, and um, uh, we built these walkways, these elevated walkways, actually, that are a foot above the, the attic plane. And then we added 15, 18 inches of insulation. Thank you. Um, ventilation, that's the third piece of the coin. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to have your, your attic space, the cold space above your insulation, well ventilated. Um, and um, I'll skip through the stuff about the sample reports. Um, there's all sorts of challenges and materials that we run into, whether it's uh, vermiculite or just garbage in people's attics. Um, it's not pretty, um, but um, it's, it's the work that we do. Uh, I'll skip through the multifamily. Let me just talk for a minute about um, uh, the, the programs outside of the regular mass save that you might that everybody probably knows about, the single family program that everybody's had an energy audit. Um, you know, there was a big space in um, renovations and additions that no one was really um, providing any incentives for. And so MassSave created a renovations and additions program a couple years ago. We were one of the pilot contractors working with it. And it brings up to $10,000, I believe, in credits for people uh, to do things in a renovation setting uh, that include closed cell spray foam, mini splits, uh, windows and doors. So that's pretty, uh, pretty great. Um, we also work with our partners, uh, partner organizations like, uh, like CET and Clear Result um, on commercial projects. Um, I think we've done about 25, 30 churches, another Mount Holyoke project. Here's a church in Amherst that we did. Um, you know, we were working with green communities sometimes, uh, we're working with the utilities at, and other times, or both, um, trying to, you know, help people uh, in their communities, with their businesses, uh, find ways to help underwrite and incentivize uh, insulation projects that they could not otherwise afford. Um, working with uh, nonprofits and houses of worship are uh, a high priority for us at Energia. Um, uh, this is a church up in Pittsfield. And um, you know these beautiful old buildings, they seem to be some of the worst insulated buildings. We've, we've worked with towns, and I remember in, in Northfield, I think, the entire congregation were wearing their winter jackets and gloves when they went to services. And uh, we, we you know, found a way to uh, bring some incentives to them. I think they paid for 80% of this project. It was almost, I think it was close to a $100,000 project. So you know, this is not peanuts that we're talking about. And, you know, they would have not, never been able to do these projects otherwise. So we're really excited about, you know, working with those groups and with other nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity, um, where we do a couple projects every year. I'm kind of running out of time here, so uh, I, will, I will leave it there and just see if anybody has any, uh, any questions for a minute. Um, yes, uh, back there first, and then we'll go over here. Yeah, um, great question. Um, there, uh, we, we've seen insulation like uh, fiberglasses that are 50, 60 years old and they do degrade. Um, and so we actually uh, downgrade them, um, for the existing insulation if it's really old by about 30%. Um, it does break down. Um, cellulose has been around for you know, 30, 40 plus years almost, although it wasn't really widely used in the beginning. Um, some of that cellulose gets a little bit crunchy um, in an open attic setting. It does settle. Um, what we found was that in, uh, in wall cavities where, where cellulose or other insulations are dense packed, um, there's this thing called settling that happens. And uh, what we didn't know 20 years ago was that uh, what was the right density to blow that insulation in so that it remains self-supporting for all time. Uh, we know now that three and a half pounds of pressure makes it so that that insulation will sit, stay in its p place forever, basically. Um, but uh, I guess every material has, has a life, lifespan to it, and you just have to sort of take that into consideration. Uh, yes, right here. What about the air quality change in the building after you seal it? 
Right. Um, well, that's part of what we, why we do the blower door test. Um, we do it before to see how tight the building is. The, um, you know, we don't see it that often, but there is such a thing as too tight. Um, and uh, there's a thing called the building airflow standard and the building tightness limit. Um, and uh, the building tightness limit, if you, if you go past that number in the building that you're looking at, uh, technically you're, you have a requirement to add mechanical ventilation uh, to it. And so we try to bring buildings right up to that limit, but not past that limit. Um, but it is always a consideration of ours for sure. And, and there are opportunities for adding more ventilation if you need to. Yes? Uh, see if, you, if, you, if a homeowner has a project, would we call you first or we call Mass Save or how, how to yeah. Um, great news is you could do either of those things. Um, and, and of course, Energy is just one of the contractors working in Western Mass. There's at least 15 other contractors. Um, you know, the great majority of them are pretty good. Um, Mass Save is a fixed price program, and so the contractors don't set the price. Um, which is great for the consumer, not so great for the contractors. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so depending on the type of project, you could certainly call us. Um, and that applies to residential. Um, you know, if you have a, a business uh, or your office or your church or your school or house of worship or the, the place that you go, a nonprofit that you work at to, uh, um, you know, a, a, a senior center or anything like that, there, there are some amazing incentives that are available for, for folks, um, uh, both on the insulation side as well as on the uh, heating, cooling, lighting, and water management side. Um, yes, right there. So how material costs change? Because all this year that the construction materials seems to be skyrocketed. Yowza. Yes. Um, you know, prices have, uh, I mean, you, you heard how, how the price of uh, lumber went up, you know, 200 percent or something, you know, quickly, and now it's sort of starting to come back down. Same thing happens with insulation, cellulose, uh, rigid foam board, spray foam. We've seen three to four price increases a year from the manufacturer in the past year. Um, we have not passed that along to our customers, though. Um, we've passed a small portion of it along to them. Um, but it does make it uh, harder and harder for contractors to, uh, to make a decent, uh, decent profit. And um, you know, as great as the Mass Save program is, they are a fixed price program, and they've not changed their prices for three years. So um, we're dying, <laughs> you know, in a sense. Um, uh, there, there's some discussion going on right now about making some price changes, and uh, they did give us a, an increase, a small increase across the board as a temporary measure. Um, thank you. Uh, I saw one other question there, and I think that's probably about all the time we have, but go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm actually an account manager and inspector for the Renovations and Additions Program. You and I spoke a couple of years ago. I was a little comment here. I've seen a whole bunch of your work um, uh -huh. after the sign. You get to great work, so you know, good job. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the Renovations and Additions Program, um, you know, it's just such a great tool for people. They do have to hire what's called a HERS rater. Um, I'm not a HERS rater, so I'm not sure <laughs> it's something that, that I do, but um, we have a lot of great HERS raters um, in, in our community. Um, a couple of them are speaking here. Uh, CET has, I think, six or seven HERS raters on staff, um, and they do an energy modeling um, of the different measures that you're going to be doing, be it uh, insulation, either with spray foam or cellulose, um, windows, doors, mini splits, um, and then they, they model that, and uh, based on that modeling and what you're going to, to sort of save in terms of energy, there's a credit that you get for that. And um, before, there was never any incentive for that at all, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, we're, we, we really count on our utility partners and the, and the, the lead vendors like uh, Clear Result and CET to you know, be on the cutting edge of, uh, you know, some of these uh, new ideas, uh, but also to be, you know, keeping an eye out for the best interests of the customer, but also their contractor partners who, um, of course, they wouldn't be able to do anything without. Uh, one last question. Do we have time? Okay. Yes. Just very quickly, where do you get information for this renovation program? Is it on the MassSafe um, site? It is on the MassSafe site. Just uh, you go onto the MassSafe site and look up renovations and additions. Um, and they will tell you about all of the HERS raters in the area, as well as some, some basic information about you know, the requirements for the program. Um, but if you're building a, an addition, if you're doing a renovation in, 
in you know one of your bedrooms or living rooms, um, you know this program could be for you. It's it's uh, pretty fantastic that way. Um, well, thank you everybody. It's been a great audience. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Um, Mark Tajima at Energia. Um, you feel free to to give us a call or send us an email. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Sir. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so our third and last speaker is Ashley Muspratt, who is the Director of Innovation at the Center for Ecotechnology, where she uh, joined in 2018. In this role, she identifies strategic and emerging opportunities across CET's focus areas and works with the President and other directors to set priorities and bring opportunities to fruition. She has broad experience with the organization's nation-leading wasted food programming, building sector decarbonization and deconstruction. Ashley has an MS in environmental engineering and a PhD in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley. And she's gonna be talking about mini splits and air source heat pumps. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks a lot for being here today. I know you have a lot of opportunities on Saturday, so appreciate your prioritizing our climate. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction to CET, and then um, to kind of kick off this conversation, I'll make the case for electrification, just make sure we're all on the same page there. And then I'll really focus in on opportunities for decarbonizing and electrifying your home. So CET is an environmental nonprofit. We've been around for over 45 years, helping people and businesses save energy and reduce waste. We do most of our work through state and federal agency contracts, utility contracts, and um, foundation grants. Uh, at this point, we're working in every pocket of Massachusetts. Our wasted food work has expanded into about eight states. And we also own Eco Building Bargains, which is a reclaimed building material store in Springfield. It's kind of like a home depot of used building materials, really fun place to shop, and we're the largest store of its kind in New England. We like to sum up our work by saying we make green make sense. So when it comes to thinking about decarbonizing our economy, I think it really boils down to four key levers, right? We need to electrify buildings, we need to electrify industry, we need to electrify transportation, and then we need to green and modernize the grid. This chart here, I think, is a really good indication of the role, the relative roles of greening the grid and electrifying homes when it comes to decarbonizing the residential sector. So you see right now, we really need to be doing both of those things simultaneously. Earlier today, Chris mentioned the 2050 decarbonization roadmap. And in that, it says that in order to hit our 2030 goal of 50% emissions reductions here in Massachusetts, we need to electrify the heating systems in a million homes. Just kind of quick back of the envelope math there, that's over 300 heat pumps that need to go into homes every single day between now and 2030. Pretty, pretty daunting numbers, I'd say. So let's talk about the clean energy transition for homes. You heard from Mark about weatherization. You absolutely want to start with efficiency, right? Reduce the energy load of your building in the first place. Get it as tight as possible. You heard from Claire about solar. That's another thing to look at. What are the opportunities on your own home for installing panels or for investing in community solar or otherwise buying credits? And then what I want to talk about today are electrifying your heating and cooling systems. I'll spend most of the time on heat pumps, but I also want to talk about other opportunities for electrifying equipment and appliances in your home. So heat pumps are, as I said, a key, key lever to decarbonizing the residential sector. And the thing to know about heat pumps, to understand what makes them so efficient when it comes to emissions reductions and cost effectiveness, is that they're moving heat instead of generating heat. By definition, when you're generating heat, you're going to have losses. In the case of heat pumps, in the winter, what they're doing is taking heat from the outdoor air. Yes, they can capture heat in our outside cold temperatures and moving it into your home. 
And then in the summer, they work in reverse. They're taking heat from your home and pushing it to the outside. Now, over the course of the winter heating season here in Massachusetts, on average, a heat pump is able to generate three and a half units of heat, or move, rather. This is the key point here. They don't generate heat, they move heat. So they move three and a half units of heat for every unit of energy they use. So that's a 350% efficiency. In the shoulder seasons, they can be as much as 500% efficient. So moving five units of heat for every unit of energy they're using. Colder times of year, they of course go down in efficiency. They're also incredibly versatile. I'm sure you're all kind of familiar with these kind of ceiling or wall mounted close to the ceiling units. They're also these really nice sleek kind of floor mounted units that you're seeing here in the lower right. And then there are also ducted systems. These are sleek kind of discrete options that can take advantage of existing ductwork in your home or that you can use new ductwork. And you see they're just the, the vents on the ceiling. Now to be sure, the installation costs of heat pumps are more expensive than the fossil, fossil fuel alternative, and I mean the upfront costs. If you look at the life cycle, full life cycle cost of heat pumps, they're becoming increasingly cost competitive, particularly if you're using oil or propane. These are very kind of rough and I would say conservative numbers, but if you're putting a single head mini split in your home, that'll run about $5,000, could be as low as $3,500, could be a little bit more than that, but round numbers, $5,000 for a single zone, say one ton system. A whole home air source heat pump, the cost of that is of course dependent on the area of conditioned space in your room, but for a typical size home in Massachusetts, I would say anywhere from fifteen dollars to $30,000 would be the cost of a whole home retrofit of a heat pump system. Ground source heat pumps are going to start at about $35,000, so more expensive than air source heat pumps, but the key to note there is that they have significantly longer lifespans. The outdoor component of the ground source heat pump, which is the big expense, right? Drilling the, the wells and laying the coils, those have a 50 plus lifetime, lifetime, basically the lifetime of your building. And so over the full life cycle, they are really becoming increasingly cost competitive. Now these are the full installation costs and of course there are incentives available. So MassSave has a $1,250 per ton um, incentive. So if you're doing a partial displacement, you're gonna keep your, your boiler or furnace in place but install a heat pump, you can access $1,250 per ton. What's new here is that previously that incentive existed, but you could only access it if you were heating with oil or propane. Now, as of January 2022, gas customers are also eligible for that incentive. So this is huge, that gas customers can now access incentives for heat pumps in the residential sector. They've also, just this year, introduced a new whole home um, incentive that's worth $10,000. So, on average, this is going to be significantly more than 1,250 per ton. I would say most homes are gonna need anywhere from a two and a half to four ton system. So when you kind of do that math out, this is a very attractive, and they're really trying to push people to go kind of all out for the whole home system. Important note here is that, that accessing that incentive has conditions, one of them being that you have to fully weatherize your home. And you can learn more about what those conditions are on the MassSave website. Similarly, there's a handsome incentive for ground source heat pumps because their starting price is higher and they're also more efficient. Um, that incentive is worth $15,000. Um, similarly, to qualify for that incentive, you do need to full, fully weatherize your home and, and meet a set of conditions that your contractor or your home energy auditor could help you out with. Now, in addition to the mass save, uh, 
incentives, there's also state and federal uh, money on the table. So both air source and ground source heat pumps qualify for alternative energy certificates. A typical size um, whole home heat pump system could generate somewhere between $1,000 and $3,600 in alternative energy certificates over the life of the system. Now, in addition to these, ground source heat pumps are also exempt from the state sales tax and um, are eligible for the federal investment tax credit that Claire mentioned with respect to solar. So because these are geothermal systems, they also qualify for this tax credit. She showed you the timeline um, for those for those credits being retired, so you do have to act quick to take advantage of them because right now they are slated to disappear after 2023. Last thing I want to mention um, with regard to heat pumps and, and financing them is the Mass Save loan. This is kind of a no-brainer. It's a 0% interest loan for up to seven years and up to $25,000 of the investment. Now, I do want to mention before I wrap up um, a few other electric appliances, just kind of put them on, the, on your radar as you're thinking about decarbonizing your home. And I want to start with induction stoves. I think the gas industry has done a really good job convincing us that there's nothing like cooking with gas, but I want to tell you that today we're cooking with magnets. So induction stoves use electromagnetic energy to generate heat. They're incredibly efficient. They use three times less energy than conventional stoves. And they're also incredibly sensitive and precise, just like a gas stove. When you adjust the intensity, they respond very, very quickly. You can see in the image here, only the surface that is in contact with the pan, a compatible pan, heats up. So when you take your pan off, you can touch that burner. And things that are on the surface that aren't in a pan don't heat up. So you're not going to burn on fuel, food. They're very easy to clean. And again, as soon as you adjust the level of the heat or take it off, it responds very, very quickly. From an environmental perspective, perspective. They cut your cooking emissions in half, um, and that's assuming you're drawing off of today's grid. And there's a really compelling health reason. There's a trove of research that shows that children who live in homes with gas stoves have a 40% increased risk of childhood asthma. They equate it to living with a smoker. A few other electric appliances, I, before I move on from that, I should note, right now there aren't incentives through Mass Save for induction stoves, although there is a lot of chatter about adding them. And CET is working with municipal light plants in other parts of the state who have introduced them. And we've even set up lending kits in a few local libraries so people can check out a countertop version of induction stove and test the technology before they commit. Uh, I want to mention uh, heat pump up water heaters as another electric appliance. These do have a mass savings. It's an instant rebate of $750. They work on the same principles as the space heating heat pumps, so they're drawing heat from the ambient air and using it to heat the water in your tank. They're incredibly efficient as a result of that and can, dr can dramatically reduce your, your operating costs. Finally, we've all heard of electric drivers, but a fairly new technology is a heat pump clothes dryer. Again, working on the same principle, they're drawing the warm, moist air in the drum and circulating it in a closed loop system. Um, one thing that's really neat about these is they're quite compact and they don't need to be vented because it's a closed loop system. So they're a great option for apartments, for example, or spaces that don't have an opportunity to vent to the, to the outside. So I'm going to leave it at that. I want to um, provide you with some resources here. If you want to learn more about the heat loan, there's a dedicated website, myheatloan.com. Um, Mass Save, of course, has information about all of the incentives I talked to about today. If you haven't heard of it, um, Mass CEC's Clean Energy Lives Here campaign is phenomenal. Um, if you go to their website, they have dedicated guides for each of the technologies I talked about today, plus many more. They give you guidance on talking to contractors. They give you guidance on figuring out if a technology is the right fit for your home. There's um, uh, information about costs and so on. 
NEEP, um, has some really great information on cold climate heat pumps. And finally, if I've piqued your interest on induction stoves, you can learn more about those at our website, forward slash cooking with magnets. And I'll thank you and happy to take some questions. So uh, first question is on the heat pumps, are there any, um, for municipalities, are there any incentives when it comes to doing yeah, there are commercial incentives as well, and they actually start at $2,500 a ton. Um, and I'm not aware of there being the, the full building, but again, the, um, the per ton incentive is $2,500 for commercial. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. So an all-in-one washer-dryer, that's great. Thanks for mentioning that. And I think you had a question too? Oh, same comment, okay. Yes. So, uh, what, what might be the uh, ecological uh, effects of, say, a million, millions of people uh, uh, drying air, warming into the house, or vice versa, or something like that? Uh, is there any kind of a lack That's an interesting question. Um, I can say that heat pump hot water heaters inside the home, because you're talking about a relative an enclosed space, you will notice a drop in the temperature in the room where your heat pump hot water heater is, and they also have a dehumidifying effect. My sense, and, and perhaps I should defer to our climate scientists here, is that um, outdoor uh, air source heat pumps, I mean, it's such a massive, massive ocean compared to, you know, the little heat they're drawing in. I, I, my sense is that there wouldn't be an ecological impact, even if the whole neighborhood has them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, sorry. It seems like um, if you took advantage of the mass save incentives and all the tax credits for a whole house heat pump, you would get. <laughs> it seems like if you took advantage of the mass save incentives um, and the tax credits all together for a whole house heat pump, it would save you more than 50% of the cost. Is that correct? What, what is the overall outlook for that? Yeah, I mean, like I said, your starting um, range, again, on average, is going to be fifteen to 30000 for a whole home system. So right off the bat, if you can shave $10,000 off of that, yeah, you, you could, that could be two-thirds of your cost. And then, again, the other incentives. So um, the incentives we have right now can, can take you a really long way and, and, and is what is making them so cost competitive against fossil fuel alternatives, especially then when you look at your decreases in your operating costs. I think you had a hand up over here. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning the air quality issues and internal air quality issues around gas appliances. We just moved into a new build condo. The developer was all gas and was all things. And I had never lived in a gas heating or gas stove. And I've noticed it's just like coughing more. And we're going to have to get rid of it. I had never heard that before. I never liked it. Yeah, if you just uh, do a quick Google search, you'll see over the last couple years, more and more peer-reviewed research and mainstream media have been sort of reporting on this phenomenon. Just in the last month, I saw a big article in the New York Times, in the Boston Globe, in the Washington Post. Um, but you know, schools of public health across the country have been have been documenting this, and, and in other parts of the world for for decades. Yes, I can't keep track of who. <laughs> Uh, that after Thanksgiving when everybody eats the pills with a bowl of turkey and then uh, falls asleep because of the tryptophan, about 10% of those people are not falling asleep because of the tryptophan. It's because the turkey's been cooking in the oven for the last six to eight hours and the amount of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in the oven. 
interesting. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to add that with heat pumps, when, when, we're, when you're doing a mini split anyway, and you're replacing a system that um, maybe a traditional plenum type heating system with duct work, you're replacing that kind of system, you are going to need some kind of fresh air ability there. The, the heat pump, if it's a, a mini split, it doesn't draw in air from the outside. It circulates interior air. Uh, so there is another unit that would go with a heat pump in that case. Yeah, I mean, the middle, all, all air source heat pumps have an outdoor compressor. Yeah, um, the makeup air. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, pump. okay. Yep. I think a lot of times, you know, we'll retrofit the house with a heat pump and what is needed after that is an ERV, which is another fresh yep. air heat pump, mm -hmm. basically, where you're scavenging the interior air, but just not. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, Mark. Actually, um, I know that there's a couple of arguments on either side for this, but um, everybody starts putting heat pumps in their homes. Um, what do they do with their existing systems? Uh, some, some people I've heard like the idea of having sort of a backup redundant system. Other people, it's like fossil fuel as a backup system is a horrible idea. Um, and there was a time when, when you know, heat pump technology was not as, as, as well developed as it is now, not as perfect, didn't work as well in super cold climates um, or cold, super cold days. Um, any thoughts on, on where that is or where to go with that? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I, I can speak from experience and from uh, all of the customers that we've worked with that the technology definitely is there for whole home systems without any backup, even in an 1800s sort of New England home. Um, I mean, in terms of the practicalities of removing the old system, um, different programs, especially if we're talking about municipal light plants, have different conditions for what it takes to access certain incentives. And I'm not sure, to be honest, if the whole home incentive for mass save requires physical removal of the system from the home, because that's, that's an expense. So it may be that you size your heat pump system to cover 100% of the load and have no intention of ever running your furnace, but you leave it there because it's it would be expensive Some to. Some programs in other states, I know they do have a requirement that in order to get the incentive, you have to remove the, the, the old fossil fuel system. Um, and uh, then I've also heard the other end of the argument, which is, you know, it might not be a bad idea to have a, a system in case the electric goes down, or not that some things can't run on electric, but. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we certainly also work with customers to design um, very limited bits of electric resistance heating if they want to completely get off fossil fuels. Of course, electric resistance isn't, you know, it nearly, it's very inefficient. But if you're just doing a little bit of a strip in a bathroom, for example, um, you know, it's very little added cost and can be a way to get off fossil fuels. But, um, you know, make sure that all of the rooms in the house are comfortable. How are we doing with time, Chris? Okay. Is there someone I haven't heard from yet, or? Okay. So you talk a lot, a lot about cost, cost, and then cost savings, dollars, uh, dollars. So can you quantify the, the cost savings, the savings in terms of the entire environment? Is there a way to quantify Yeah, um, there absolutely is a way. I'm not sure I can um, give you those numbers off the top of my head, but it, interestingly at CET, I'm, I'm actually working with our MLP, our municipal light plant clients on developing carbon-based incentives. So actually quantifying what is the full life cycle kind of on average carbon offset associated with different measures, with weatherization, with heat pump hot water heaters, with air source heat pumps, and then setting a carbon price and saying, okay, we're willing to pay $100 a ton for carbon. What, what would we pay in incentives for these technologies? So I could get back to you if you give me your contact info. It's, I've got it in a spreadsheet, but I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to state the, 
the, the wrong number. But I mean, it's, it's many tons of carbon over the lifetime of the system for, the, for, for a whole home heat pump. And in that graph that I showed at the beginning of my presentation, they're really a key part of decarbonizing the residential building sector. residents to look at all of these because I want to get more solar, I want to check out renovation, I want to find out about heat pumps, I want to time it around the tax incentives, and I'm overwhelmed right now about where where's the best place to start because I've had Mass Safe come and they recommended certain things, which was great, they had them done. But I hadn't thought of it in terms of the solar and the federal tax incentives and, and the renovations. And I'm like, wow, I could do a whole lot and I don't know where to start. Sure. Uh, well, you could call CET. <laughs> I mean, we're not we're not the only ones. But um, since you asked, um, our high performance building team does sort of exactly that kind of work. We work with um, residential customers all over the valley um, to advise on you know passive house lead certification, whatever it is you're looking to do, kind of path to net zero um, work in your home. Well, it's the Center for Eco Technology, CET. Our, it's, it's our high performance building team. Or you can reach out to me and I can connect you. Um, okay, we have time for one more. So, so that's a change because uh, we've been doing weatherizing for more than a decade. And when they, you know, and you can have them come back out. But they see that we have solar, we've now weatherized, we've done other things, and they kind of give up because they, 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 that's what they do, and we're, we're already beyond that. But you're saying this high, high performance weather team can go beyond that? This is, uh, this is separate. This is outside the Mass Save program. This is like our sort of private consulting arm of the organization and yeah there are others too who are we good Our, oh no it's it's a fee it's fee for service work yeah I see that there's a need for something like this that's like mass save but helping somebody evaluate whether it's better to install a solar panel and do electric heat versus heat pump and things like that. And also, to build on your question, question depending on where, what climate you're living in, if it's specific to Western Mass, or maybe some areas might be better to have a solar panel electric heat. Like that. So I can see your services being needed on a pro bono basis, like a state. So, I won't call you on the so there is a program through Community Action for low-income folks, those that are income eligible. They are starting a, uh, a whole house program to evaluate people's ho homes, those who have less access to um, all this information. So they are starting to do some of that. And let, me, let me plug one other program. The um, Mass CEC has a new program called Decarbonization Pathways. And they are going to be looking for participants in a pilot program for people who want to do a whole home decarbonization. And I think there'll probably be a call in the next month or so for participants in that with very big incentives. Um, so thank you, Ashley. And let's have a round of applause for all of our speakers. Great job.